than our ailments. Let's pray. Jesus, you are good. God, you are great. And we are so thankful that we can be part of your family. And as we talk about you today, would you come and fill in the details and let us see your glory, we pray in your name. Amen. If I were a billionaire like George Soros or Donald Trump or whoever else, there are a few of them out there, and I decided I wanted to have gold-plated bathroom fixtures and gold-plated car ornaments, would you consider that extravagant? That's considered extravagant. Now, if I decided that for my front lawn, in the Arizona style, I was going to do gravel. Gravel in my front lawn. And I was going to make that gravel gold nuggets. Would that be extravagant? You have heard of the man in the apocryphal story who showed up at the pearly gates of heaven with a, a small bag. And uh, St. Peter said, I'm sorry, sir, you can't bring anything in here. And he said, well, Peter, while I was alive back on earth, God and I cut a deal that I could just take one thing. Peter said, the rule has been nothing. But I'll go check with the father, with the boss, and see what he has to say. But before, can I just look in your bag, see what you brought? So he looks in the bag, the man holds it open, and he goes, pavement? Now, do I need to help you with that just a little bit? What's the most valuable thing people have on this earth? And what are the streets of heaven paved with? You realize if you showed up at the pearly gates with a whole truck of pavement, they'd simply thought you were on the street repair crew. If you had a whole truckload of gold, it would just be pavement. You know, extravagance is all based on supply and demand, right? So when it comes to God, have you noticed how extravagant he is? I mean, the last few days, there has been a mockingbird outside our house. Now that's extravagant. This guy sings all day. All day. He doesn't quit. I'm glad he goes to sleep at dark. He doesn't need an audience. There's nobody lined up to listen to him. He's just... experiencing the joy, right? You look out in the woods, there are millions of square miles of forest with gorgeous flowers, orchids. Who's going to see them? They're just there. We serve what I put down as the title of the sermon, a recklessly, wastefully extravagant God. You know, when <clears throat> a few years ago there's a little book put out, and then I actually saw it done as a video. Um, I need to find that. It was really cool. If you travel out in the universe, it just gets grander and better. It gets more glorious and perfect and wonderful. And then if you collapse down the other way and you move down into the microscopic, the further you go, the grander it is. The closer you look, the more perfect it is. There's a phenomenon that anything that humans being cre human beings work on the closer you look, the more imperfections you see. I've been told that if you had a one-inch steel ball and you polished it, as polished as a human being can polish it, to where it is absolutely, flawlessly smooth and shiny, and you blew it up to the size of the world, you'd have mountains and valleys and canyons greater than the Everest and the Grand Canyon. 
If you polish it and polish it, and then you look at it through a microscope, you start to see the flaws. Anything that man puts his hand to, the closer you look, the more flaws you find. Anything God made, or that evolution says is there by accident, the closer you look, the finer is the detail and the intricacy and the balance and the beauty of it all. In fact, if you go all the way in the molecular and the atomic levels, you realize that if we were just small enough, you've got solar systems down there, right? And it seems that the, 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 the smaller we look, we still always find another layer. There's something down there as we get the ability to detect it. And it's perfect. It's in balance. There's beauty. It's never rough around the edges and needs some sanding. We serve an extravagant, recklessly wasteful God that when he makes something, it's good to the grandest and it's good to the tiniest. No detail is missing. Now, if you think about it, <clears throat> if God wants to pave his streets with gold, that's just fine. Because he can make all the gold he wants to. I mean, if you were able to walk out in your front yard one day and let's say, I'd like those rocks to be gold. Boom, they were gold. Next day, I want them to be silver. Next day, we'll have them all rubies. Let's do a mixture of emeralds and diamonds today, right? No big deal. So in a way, when we talk about God's extravagance, if we compare it in the area of material things, it's really a non-issue because God can make whatever he wants to make. Extravagance seems to be a wasteful use of limited supply, right? If there's only so much water, you know, for the family to drink and you spend it watering your plants, that's extravagant if there's only enough for the family to drink, right? So it's all about supply and demand. In reality, where I find the reckless, wasteful extravagance of God the most impactful is when we look at the relational side of God. We've been talking about this the last time we were together, the whole Evenden series, the relational side of God. It's about relationships, it's not about stuff. God wants a relationship with us. He doesn't want your obedience, he wants friendship. By the way, obedience and righteousness will come along with it. There are three viewpoints of the cross in theological circles. I read a book recently called um, The Fire That Consumes by a guy named Fudge. He wrote it back in the 80s. Uh, a southern Christian in the area where everybody believes you're going to get burned forever in hell who started studying hell and decided that's not what the Bible said and came out sounding kind of like an Adventist on that subject. And I was reminded again of this concept in reading that book. There is a concept in the theological world called limited atonement limited atonement now what does atonement mean tear the word apart at one meant what happened at the tree of knowledge of good and evil was the fruit bad no was eating fruit bad no so why was eating that fruit bad because God said no and he wants you to do what he wants you to do and if you don't do what he says he'll no, no, no. Why was eating that fruit bad? Because it was the way God gave us to, decide, to make a choice whether we wanted to be in relationship with him or not. Because you see, love requires choice. If you're stuck with someone and have no way to leave them, you can't really love them. Because love is a daily choice to be in relationship, right? 
And so Adam and Eve come into this perfect, beautiful world with everything they need and a God who keeps showing up and wants to have conversation. And the only way they can really, truly be in love with God is to have some way they can choose to opt out. And that's what the tree was. We simply broke up with God at the tree and went off with some stranger. And God, the entire scripture, is the story of God trying to woo us back into relationship with him. God coming after us, not to punish us but to win our hearts back. Now, is there punishment? Well, I suppose, because you see, if you break up with the one who is, li who is life, what have you broken up with? God says, if I actually go away and leave you alone, like you're telling me to with sin, you'll die. It doesn't say I'll kill you. But I'm life, and the other guy that you took off with isn't life. I mean, to just use a monetary thing, if you're married to a millionaire and you take off with some guy that doesn't even have a job, what's going to happen to the financial situation? You're going to end up poor, not because your former spouse is punishing you. You left the money and went off with the poor, right? If you leave the life, you go off with the death. And don't you find it interesting that in the devil's side of things, there is a fascination with death. He can't give you a fascination with life because he doesn't have life to give. So he's got to somehow make you think this is a good thing, ending up dead. God says, no, that's not a good thing at all. That's bad. That's the end. Come to me and live. God doesn't say, serve me or die. He says, you're dying. Serve me and live. Come to me and live. So the whole thing of the tree of knowledge of good and evil was mankind breaking up with God, who happens to be the source of our life. Which means we're doomed. We ran off with the wrong lover. And all of scripture is about God seeking atonement at one meant. We kind of interpret atonement as somehow atoning for our sins by doing a bunch of good things or something, right? Wrong use of the word. We, it's a total wrong use of the word. At one minute is a relational word. At one minute is not to pay off, it's to get connected with. Okay? So to make atonement for our sins sounds like being paid off. No, it's to come back into relationship. So scripture is all about God wanting to come back into relationship with humankind. So when we get to the cross... The greatest example, or the, not example, but the greatest event in the restoration of the relationship between God and man. The idea of limited atonement comes in two versions. But the idea is that God didn't save everyone. Because if God is sovereign, if someone is sovereign, what does that mean in our thinking? They get their way. You can't say no. If they want it, it happens. Is God sovereign? Yeah, so those who focus more on the sovereignty of God, especially the Calvinists, Reformed, Protestants, have a belief that we call predestination, which says God is sovereign, period. That means if you're saved, he chose you to be saved. If you're lost, he chose you to be lost because he's sovereign and sovereign gets its way. Who can resist the will of God? That's actually a phrase from Paul, which gets, I think, misused. But it's the main idea of predestination. Now, if God decides that some will be saved and God decides that others will be lost, whose sins did he bear on the cross? Only the sins of the ones he chose to save. Because if he bore the sins of the one he didn't choose to save, he would be choosing to save them. 
kind of circular logic, but you get that? If he bore your sins, you're going to heaven whether you go kicking and screaming or want to or not. You're going. If he didn't bear your sins, doesn't matter how much you want to go there. You don't have a ticket. So predestination is built on the idea of limited atonement. Somehow at the cross, Jesus only bore the sins of those that God chose to save. Now that's on the predestination side. On the flip side, you have what's you know Calvinism and Arminianism. And the reason they get those names is back in the 1500s, Calvin was the champion of predestination. In fact, Luther would believed in predestination. Almost all the reformers did. And then there was this guy, I think it was up in Holland, by the name of Arminius. And he said, no, the Bible says God gives us free will. And believe it or not, the Calvinists burned the Arminians at the stake for believing that. It cost you your life to believe in free will. But Arminius believed that God... bore our sins on the cross and lets us decide whether we want to receive that benefit. Now, I'm an Arminian. Because to me, within Calvinism, there cannot be love. I know all Calvinists would disagree, and that's fine. But how can you have love if you don't have choice? So if there is no free human will, then there really is no love in the universe. And therefore, God is not love. We are not love. It's all just a programmed thing. Now, I, I, I will tell you, when I get through talking that way, you'd think Calvinists are idiots, and they're not. I've actually heard people defend Calvinism in a way that I was able to say, they're thinking people. I don't agree with them, but they've got this evidence and that evidence. So I'm not trying to be derogatory here, but to me it doesn't work. But Arminius, essentially Arminius believed that we had free will, and yet he believed in the sovereignty of God. So Arminius' viewpoint was that God didn't just die for the people he predestined, rather he died and bore the sins of those he foreknew. And you're kind of scratching your head saying, what's the difference? Well, it's just whether you have free will or not. But in reality, still with the sovereignty of God idea, when Jesus went to the cross, he bore upon him the sins of those he knew would receive him. Of those he foreknew, he knows the end from the beginning, that he knew would make the choice. It's still limited atonement. He only provides salvation for those that he knows will accept it. After all, if you provide it for those you know aren't going to accept it, isn't that kind of stupid? If you know somebody's not going to accept the gift, why send them the money? Right? Makes no sense. Sort of. So did Jesus die for the sins of those he predestined to be saved? Or did he die for the sins of those he foreknew would receive him? But both is what's called limited atonement. And that's not a bad word in the theological circles. That's what most Christians, theologians, believe is in one of those forms of limited atonement. Then there are a few who believe in unlimited atonement. I'm one of those. Seventh-day Adventists are at the forefront. For the most part, Seventh-day Adventists believe in an unlimited atonement. Although there are some Adventist scholars who will argue differently that I disagree with says in 1 Peter 2.24, who himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Why does Peter use the word tree instead of cross? 
I'd like to suggest it's more than poetic. The Old Testament says, Cursed is anyone who's hung on a tree. And Jesus bore the curse of sin. In his what? Body. Body means physical. Right? This is not just intended to be a spiritual metaphor. Jesus didn't just act like he was a sinner. It wasn't a pantomime. It wasn't a play acting. Now if you back up just two verses, 1 Peter 2.22, it says that Jesus never sinned. And yet he bore our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He, God, made him Jesus, who knew no sin, he was sinless, to be sin for us. They Both those passages say the same thing. The sinless one became my sin. Now, I got in trouble the very first sermon I preached in this church 20 years ago, two weeks from Sabbath. I talked about this, that Jesus became my sin. Therefore, did Jesus... Was Jesus a sinner? No, he was sinless. But how thoroughly did he become my sin? He became it. The God who can say rock and a rock appears, and say tree and a tree appears, evidently could say sin over Jesus and gathered up every sin from the first sin of Adam to the last sin before Jesus comes and physically made Jesus to be sin. He became sin. He was not a sinner, but he became sin as much as you and I are sin. He never did it. He never did sin in behavior, but he became sin. Which would argue that sin must be more than just behavior. There must be some resident component. Which is why some of us believe we're born sinners, whether we ever sin or not. We sin because we're sinners. We act out what we are. He never acted it out, but he became what we are. You got that? Isaiah 53, 6. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I believe the Bible is clear. He bore the sin of the world. And it says God desires all men, that's mankind, ladies, you get to be included, to be saved. So let me ask you a question. Is God sovereign? Does sovereignty always get its way? In our definition, yes. Does God always get his way? No, his will is that all men be saved. Will all men be saved? No, that's why I believe in free will and yet the sovereignty of God. What it appears is that the sovereign God sovereignly chose to give us free will. I argue he can do that. He can sovereignly do that if he wants to and still be sovereign. He can give it. He could take it away. He won't. He gave it because he's love and within love, Love doesn't exist if you don't have choice. So if a sovereign wants to experience love, he's got to give free will and give up sovereignty in some area in his subjects to let them respond freely. So I'm a believer in unlimited atonement. That When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't bore the sins just of those he predestined or foreknew. He bore the sins of the world. And I believe all of that is wrapped up in the Bible's most famous verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Look at how that verse breaks down literally. I've kind of put it in the same order as the Greek. For thus God loved the cosmos. The word world is cosmos. Thus God loved the cosmos so that the son... And some of the translation, some of the ancient manuscripts have the uh, possessive pronoun there, his son. Some of them don't. 
so that the Son, the only begotten, that's a very unique word in Scripture, the uniquely begotten one. God loved, so for thusly God loved the cosmos. This is how much, and this is how. Not just how much, but how. So that the Son, the only begotten, he gave. Why? In order that everyone, while trusting in him, in order that everyone, while trusting in him, now, everyone, it doesn't just say the ones he foreknew or the ones he predestined. But anyone, that opens it up to all. That everyone, while trusting in him, it's an ongoing present tense in the Greek. If you're in a trusting, by the way, trust is a relationship. You can't trust somebody you don't know. We've been over this, right? If you get to know someone who's trustworthy, what happens automatically? The more you know them, the more you'll trust them. If you get to know someone who's not trustworthy automatically, the more you know them, the less you'll trust them. Okay? So trusting is a relational aspect. The only way to get into salvation is through relationship. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was a break in relationship. There was nothing wrong with the behaviors at the tree. Nothing wrong with eating fruit. And that fruit wasn't bad fruit. It was that that became a statement that I want to sever the relationship and take off with the enemy. So what happened at the tree was a broken relationship. So how do you solve a broken relationship? By a bunch of good works? Anybody had your spouse tell you they're not interested in you anymore? And you set out, I've seen it. I've seen it. And the, the jilted spouse sets out to try to do stuff. I had a friend years ago. He, his wife didn't want it. His wife started making these demands, even to the point where he was a pastor. He quit being a pastor because she was saying, you know, he, he was thinking if she didn't want to be a pastor's wife, so I quit being a pastor, maybe she'll still be my wife. She dumped him anyway. You know, you can't do enough things to bring back a jilted lover. The only thing that works is a restored relationship. And both parties have to be interested in that, right? So in order that everyone, while trusting, that's a relational word, not a behavioral word. While trusting in the Son, the only begotten, might not be destroyed, but might be having life eternal. Now the reason I put might in there is both of those verbs, destroyed and having, are in the subjunctive mode. The subjunctive mode is the potential mode. I might go to town today or I might not go to town. Right? I might stand up for a while or I might sit down. It's a potential word. I get to choose. Either is possible. So you have two possibilities, destroyed or having life. Well, if we went off with the one who doesn't have life and left the one who does have life, we're going to end up without life, which equals destroyed. If we come back to the one who has life and enter into a relationship with him again through trust, we're going to be having eternal life. And both are put in the potential mode. Any person, while putting their trust, restoring the relationship with Jesus, might not be destroyed. You realize the might be destroyed is a, is a fait accompli when you're running off with a destroyer. Right? That's what Satan is, is the destroyer. That might be destroyed is the default mode since the fall. We're all headed for destruction because we ran off with the destroyer. But the good news is because the sun came. By restoring a trust relationship with the sun, the other might be comes into play. I have the option for the might be living. 
I might be having life eternal. I get to make that choice. And the choice is for everyone. So if Jesus didn't die for everyone, then the choice can't be for everyone. Does that make sense? And this is where I find... I have to look at my notes to remember the sermon title. The Recklessly Wastefully Extravagance of God. He can make all the gold he wants to. He can have a city with gates of pearl and all the foundations of precious stones if he wants to, because he can make it with a thought. But you realize there's one thing God cannot make more of. This is a stupid joke, but you remember the joke of the, the farmer was, or the, 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 the uh, shepherd was playing a tune on his flute and all of a sudden the, the ram ran across the meadow and ran straight into a tree and killed himself. And then the shepherd realized he'd been playing there'll never be another you. Okay, that's a dumb joke from when I was a kid. But the reality is, the one thing God can't make is another you. He could make a million just like you, but he'd know it wasn't you. There's something in this thing being called made in the image of God, which makes us unique. Such that the who we are when we are born is something unique that will never be duplicated throughout the annals of eternity. And if a parent has a child and a child dies, that parent can have 20 other children and it will never replace the one that died. Your, your, your quiver will be full. Your home will be full. You got tons of kids. But none of those kids replace the one that got away. Isn't that right? There will never be another you. You're the only one. You'll never think about that phrase again. You're quite the same. There will never be another you. God can't make another you. So he came after you to win you back. And it's not about trying to get you to behave. It's about coming back into relationship. It's all in the verse. Amazing, reckless, wasteful extravagance of God is simply the nature of love. Love is recklessly, wastefully extravagant because love, you can have ten children and one is getting away. One you know will spit in your face and waste everything you give them, but you give to all just the same because your heart is connected, whether they give it back or not. Love is extravagantly wasteful. Jesus didn't just bear the sins of those he knew would accept him. He didn't just bear the sins of those he knew he was going to save. He bore the sins of everyone. I, I tell you, I believe based on these verses that Jesus bore the weight of the sin of those who had already lived and died and rejected him and he knew would not, could not ever accept him. <clears throat> because had he not, they never would have really had a choice. So in retrospect, he validated their choice to say no by bearing the additional pain of their sin. I am an absolute believer in unconditional, unlimited atonement, I should say, unlimited atonement. Because that's the only way John 3.16 works and that's the only way love works. I believe God saved everyone even though everyone will not be saved. 
He put it in the bank for everyone. And you can die of poverty on the street with a million bucks in the bank if you never go and draw it out. But it's there. And if I put a million dollars in your account and you never went and draw, drew it out, it would be wasted. But if I love you, truly, I will waste it on you. It's the nature of love. It's the nature of God. The absolute sovereign God who said, I absolutely sovereignly choose to be restored in relationship to every one of my children. But then I give them the choice of whether or not to receive what I have already given to them. Now you have the awesome God who is sovereign love. Sovereign love is like black white. Sovereign love is an oxymoron. And an infinite God can be two things that we can't put together. And we just have to accept he's both. And he saved everybody. Now, the extravagant, wasteful God could make every rock in the front yard gold if he wants. And it wouldn't really cost him anything. But the God of sovereign love, to bear the sins of all, in order to open up salvation to all, and restoration of trust and relationship with all, the cost was incredible. That is not like deciding whether you want the rocks today to be diamonds or gold or rubies. That cost him his heart. He poured out his heart for you. He bore the pain and consequence of your sin and mine. And there will be an empty spot in his heart for eternity if you choose not to come back to relationship with him doesn't mean God's going to be morose and unhappy for eternity. I don't believe that at all. But there will be a missing spot. Just like a parent with 12 children loses one. Life is happy, but there's a missing spot. So we talked about two weeks ago. God needs you. It's not just you need God. We talked about accepting, receiving Jesus Christ. Not just because he needs us, not just because we need him, but because he needs us. That letter from Lee Venden's mom to him, write once in a while, Lee, we need it more than you do. Mm. That stuck in my mind. God needs us as much as we need God. His heart made us. To be in relationship with him. There will never be another you. And he wants you. And he went to the cross with the sins of every single person. Unlimited atonement. So that anyone, including you, who chooses to re-enter into a trusting relationship with him. Doesn't have to go the default road to destruction. But can take that off ramp and head off on the road to life. Just one final point, John 3.16. Notice, might be having eternal life. It's interesting, the might be destroyed is in what, in the Greek, is called the aorist tense. The aorist tense. Which means a punctiliar point in, act, point in time action. The destruction will be a moment. But the might have eternal life is in the present ongoing tense. You can opt out of heading for the ultimate moment of destruction. And the moment you do, you enter into the having of eternal life. Not the having it someday when Jesus comes again. But it starts now. The minute you get off the default path to ultimate destruction, you get on the path of life. And life begins 
now. Because you're in relationship again with the one who is life. So you don't have to wait till the second coming. There may be a hiccup of death, the moment of, you know, of um, unconscious sleep till Jesus comes again. But from the moment, from the moment you step into Jesus Christ, into relationship with him, you're back in relationship with life. You're having life now. He's beginning to show you what real life is all about and how to have it. This is good stuff, folks. I believe in a sovereign, loving God who absolutely saved everybody so that you could decide whether you want to be saved. Whose heart will eternally have a little missing spot if you're not there. And when he bore the sins of us all, it wasn't like changing the rocks from gold to rubies or diamonds. It was the pouring out of his heart and the pain of a lover or a parent seeking to bring that rebellious one back who has said, leave me alone, go away. And coming to say, no, no, that's not the way to life. And I love you. We serve a recklessly, wastefully, extravagant God. And that's not in streets of gold. That's in the heart of relationships. Let's pray. Jesus, you are God. You are the incredible God. I pray that your costly bearing of sin to bring atonement will not be wasted on me or anyone in this room. I pray that you who seek reconciliation with us and have given us the ministry of reconciliation that our lives might not only happen in you that we receive life but that we will become agents of taking that life to others that more and more and more of those you died to save will actually see what you have done and choose to trust choose to re-enter relationship and I thank you for this thank you for being our recklessly wastefully extravagant. God. Amen.